And welcome back to Focal Point AFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name. Great to have you in the uh, uh, conversation. And um, I think we've got a caller on the line who actually has a personal relationship with Dr. Ben Carson, has known him for some time, and we want to make time. We're going to kind of move on and kind of shift gears a little bit, but we definitely want to make room uh, for Doris Waco, Texas. Doris, uh, welcome to Focal Point with uh, Brian Fisher. Tell us uh, about your um, relationship, your history with Dr. Ben Carson. I have known of him for several years, and I have you know, personally worked with people who have known him, and he is on the front lines. He's a Christian warrior, and I think that we should get on our knees like we pray for our military and cover him with prayers. Hmm. He is taking a stand, and he is being hammered, and it's not right. And those of us who can't get in the position that he's in to be on the front lines we can send those prayers to heaven and lift him up. And I want him to know that those of us who love him and appreciate what he is doing and being willing to take a stand, but also understand that he's not accustomed. All he's done is try to help little children. Hmm. And he is a very, very devout man. And he doesn't need to be hammered like this. And he needs to know that those of us that are his Christian brothers and sisters are willing to get on our knees and pray for him and have courage and whatever it is God has for him to do. Well, I think we're going to do that here in just a second, Doris. We'll do that here as a listening audience. So let me just ask you one last question before I let you go, and I appreciate your, your appeal and your reminder. You, you've been uh, you've known of Dr. Carson for a couple of decades. You've followed his yes. career. You've actually yes. been in contact, had relationship with people that have worked with him. Yes. Uh, have you ever heard, I mean, what, what have you heard people say about Dr. Carson, about his character and about what he's like as a person? He is a very, very nice man, a very caring, deep, deeply religious man who does what he does because he felt like God called him to do it. You ever heard anybody say anything harsh, critical, um, anybody impugn his character in all that time? Not anyone who knew him. Yeah. All right, Doris, listen, I appreciate that. And that's, that's exactly right. And, um, um, you know, I've never, I've never read anybody who's had a single bad thing, a critical thing to say about Dr. Carson. It's really kind of amazing for a guy to reach a point in his life that he has where nobody has a single bad word to say about him. And nobody did until it turned out he was a believer in the scriptures, a believer in God, a believer in God's institution of natural marriage, and then literally, and I mean this literally, all hell has broken loose against him. The very demons of hell have come out of their lair, out of their abode, to try to attack him and to try to destroy him. And Doris is uh, calling on us to uh, pray for him, and I think we ought to do that right now. So why don't we take a minute to do that as a listening audience. Father, we bring uh, Dr. Ben Carson before you. Lord, you know of his love for you, his allegiance to you, his willingness to stand for your word and to stand on your truth. You know the attack that's come against him, completely unjustified, unprincipled, unwarranted. And Lord, you see the kind of uh, immense pressure that has come against him and is resting on him right now. And Lord, we want to surround him with our faith, with our support, we pray that you'll hear our prayers on his behalf. We pray that you would assign ministering spirits, powerful warring angels, a battalion of warring angels, that you would send them to Dr. Carson's side right now to surround him, to protect him, to be a refuge for him. We pray that you would authorize them, give them power from your throne, to drive back those forces of darkness that are pressing in on him right now and trying to destroy him. We pray that you would be his rock, that you would be his refuge, that you would be a shelter in the storm for him. We pray that you would strengthen him, that you would enable him to do what you instruct us to do in scriptures after we have done everything to stand firm. Be gracious to him, strengthen him. May he know your presence and your strength at this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Doris, good word. Thank you for encouraging us to pray for him. And by the way, this is an odd thing. You, 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 you know, wouldn't be something you'd predict, but they've got higher moral standards in Russia than we do in the United States. Vladimir Putin has ordered a ban 
on adoptions by foreign same-sex couples. There's a pretty brisk trade in adoption of Russian babies, and Vladimir Putin says we are not putting these babies in same-sex households. Not going to do it. The only people that are going to be allowed legally to adopt children from Russia are going to be people who are married to each other as man and uh, woman. And, uh, you know, we shouldn't be, we ought to be encouraged. Uh, There's plenty to work with out there in continuing to defend natural marriage. I'm looking at a story here, uh, PJ Media. This is uh, from recent polling data that indicates that 66% of black Protestants say that same-sex marriage would violate their religious beliefs. 66% of black Protestants, two-thirds. Uh, Same-sex marriage would violate their religious beliefs. There's a core there with which we can work. 69% of Roman Catholics also believe that gay marriage would violate their religious uh, convictions. And we know that 70% of black voters supported Proposition 8 back in 2008 in uh, California. So it's just way too early to say that 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 the movement that supports natural marriage is in any sort of a decline or demise or about ready to go uh, out of business. This is an interesting little piece. Uh, You you may be familiar with Thomas Beatty. He is the woman that is is a victim of a mental illness. Uh, That's what the American uh, Psychiatric Association says, that gender identity disorder, uh, disorder is still a mental illness. It's still a mental disorder. Hadn't been changed yet. Uh, So if you are... Physically, biologically, by DNA, you are a, a female, but you think you are trapped inside a male body, then you have a mental illness. You have gender identity disorder. It's something that needs to be treated. You are psychologically and mentally disturbed, according to the American Psychiatric Association. That's not my opinion. That's the opinion of the mental health professionals. Now, this guy, Thomas B., well, he's a woman, He changed his name to Thomas Beatty, and we know he's a woman, even though he calls himself a man, even though he's taken hormone injections, even though he changed his his legal identification, gave himself a male name. We know he's a woman because he has given birth to three children. Now, here's the problem. We've talked about the fact that same-sex relationships are notoriously short-lived. They just don't last. They have an, an inability to sustain relationships for any uh, period of time. Now, he got married to a woman. He's a woman. She's a woman. I'm not even going to refer to him as a he because she's a she. She goes by Thomas Beatty, but she's a she. She's a woman. She gave birth to three children. She married another woman. They uh, don't want to be married anymore, but an Arizona judge won't divorce them because they were never married. They were never legally married because the state of Arizona does not recognize same-sex marriages. And the judge says, look, you're a woman. You got, we know that because you've had three kids. You got married to a woman. Arizona does not recognize that as a valid marriage. So therefore, there's no way to grant you a valid divorce. You can't get divorced unless you were married in the first place and you were a female marrying a female, not a legitimate marriage. Therefore, you cannot get a legitimate divorce. Now, I want to play a couple of quick sound bites before the end of the segment. Uh, This is a Planned Parenthood representative. Her name is Elisa LaPolt Snow. She's testifying before the Florida State Legislature in a committee hearing. And, you know, remember President Obama believed in infanticide. He did not believe that a child who survived an abortion attempt ought to get medical care. used his, his influence four times to keep that from happening. Here is a representative of Planned Parenthood arguing for infanticide if that's what the doctor and the mother want. Let's listen. Uh, it's just really hard for me to even ask you this question because I'm, I'm almost in disbelief. If a baby is born on a table as a result of a bot- botched abortion, what would, what would Planned Parenthood want to have happen to that child that's struggling for life? You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, you know, we, we believe... We believe that you know any decision that's made should be left up to the fam- to the woman, her family, and the physician. 
Okay, so that's the representative of Planned Parenthood. She is the lobbyist for the Florida Alliance of Planned Parenthood Affiliates. She's the official spokesman for all of the Planned Parenthood affiliates in Florida. It says if a child is born alive, it survives an abortion attempt, whether that baby, it's a newborn baby now, it's not in the womb anymore, it's out on the table, it's alive, whether that baby is killed or is allowed to live is up to the woman and the doctor. And she repeats that when she is asked a question by Representative Jose Oliva as a follow-up. Let's listen. Along the same lines, you stated that uh, that a baby born uh, on a table is a result of a botched abortion, that that decision should be left to the doctor and the family? Is that is that what you're saying? It, it should. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That decision should be between the, um, the, the patient and the health care provider. Hello, go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that at that point, the patient would be the child struggling on a table. Wouldn't you agree? You're recognized. That's a very good question. I really don't know how to answer that. That's just amazing to me. I mean, this is a woman. She's, uh, uh, you know, she's a nice lady. She's dressed nicely. I'm sure she's got a decent education. Uh, probably a very likable person in private life. And here she is arguing for the murder of a newborn baby. That if the mom and the doctor and the family want to kill that baby, it survived an abortion attempt. It's alive. It's a baby, it's a newborn, it's an American citizen, and it's the position of Planned Parenthood that if the mother and the doctor and the family want to kill that newborn baby, they ought to have the right to do it. And she said it not once, but she said it a second time when she was asked a follow-up question because these legislators can hardly believe uh, what they are hearing. And the second legislator says, look, if that baby survives an abortion attempt, then isn't that baby the patient? Isn't the child struggling on the table to live? Isn't, at that point, isn't the baby, the newborn baby, the patient? Shouldn't the baby be receiving the best in medical attention? And she says, well, you know, that's a good question. I have no answer to that question. Focal Point, AFR Talk, back in two. 